Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to talk about two of the greatest athletes from the 1940s and 50s. We're going to start out with Louise Bruff Clapp, or Louise Bruff as she was known at the time, one of the greatest American tennis players of the 1940s and 50s. She died recently at the age of 90, and in her era she won 10 Grand Slam singles events, including four times at Wimbledon. She and her partner, Margaret Osborne DuPont, were even better in doubles. At the U.S. Open, they won 12 times in 16 years between 1942 and 1957, and they won 21 Grand Slam events overall in women's doubles. She was a graceful but powerful player. She came from Oklahoma City, but like so many tennis players of the year, she learned her tennis in Southern California. And were it not for the fact that there were so many other great American women tennis players in the 40s and 50s, like her rivals Althea Gibson and Maureen Little Mo Connolly, she might well be called the best tennis player of the era. After World War II, she was almost a fixture at Wimbledon in the finals of some sort, and here she is in 1946 winning her first doubles with her partner Margaret Osborne DuPont. Women's doubles at Wimbledon, England. Louise Bruff and Margaret Osborne score against Pauline Betts and Doris Hart in an All-American Finals. 18,000 tennis fans see the queens of the court stage a thrilling match. Here's the point for Betts and Hart. Beaten by Miss Betts in the singles, Miss Bruff gains revenge in the doubles finals as she and her partner win two out of three sets. And this is the out that spells victory. Miss Bruff was rated the number one female tennis player in America in 1947 and the number one female tennis player in the world in 1955. And here she is winning her final Wimbledon singles in 1955. Two Americans, Beverly Baker Flights and Louise Bruff, met in the women's final. Mrs. Flights, who smoothly switched her racket for balls hit to her left, never had to make a backhand shot. But Miss Bruff, in near court, outsteadied her younger opponent to win. Accepting congratulations on her fourth Wimbledon title, the champion received Queen Louise Bruff. Probably Miss Bruff's most memorable victory was her 1950 singles victory at the U.S. Open against her rival, Althea Gibson, the great African-American female tennis player. Althea Gibson was actually ahead in the final set when rain halted the event and it had to be continued the next day. And here Miss Gibson talks about it many years later. The first time I played at Forest Hills, it was against, I think, the defending champion at the time, Louise Bruff. I was beating her. I think it was set apiece. And the third set, I was leading. And all of a sudden, the clouds open up. The sky got dark as if as they didn't want me to win this match. And the rains came pouring down. The lightning came immediately and struck the eagle on that corner of the stadium and tumbled it down. And they had to postpone the match. I had to sleep on that, that overnight. And the next day, I came out, I didn't have nothing. I lost all sting, and she beat me. That women's finals in the 1950 U.S. Open was one of the most memorable post-war tennis matches. And an important footnote to the careers of both Althea Gibson and Louise Bruff Clapp. Well, around the same time that Louise Bruff was dominating women's tennis, there was a right-handed hitter for the Pittsburgh Pirates who was dominating the pitching in the National League. That was Ralph Kiner, who died recently at the age of 91. He was an immortal for the Pittsburgh Pirates as a player, and later on, after his playing career, as an immortal for the New York Mets as an announcer. He also had a short stint in Chicago. He played two years for the Cubs, and he was an announcer for one year with the White Sox before he moved on to the Mets. On top of all that, he was quite a gregarious guy, and he once dated Elizabeth Taylor. Ralph Kiner, Elizabeth Taylor, Joe DiMaggio, Marilyn Monroe. I'll let you decide. Here's MLB with a discussion of the career of Ralph Kiner. Ralph Kiner is a good distance hitter, with a record to be proud of early in his career. Born on October 27, 1922, in Santa Rita, New Mexico, Ralph Kiner was signed by the Pirates following his senior year of high school. After a stint with the Navy Air Corps, Kiner made his major league debut in 1946. Just to be out of the service and be able to play ball again was the inspiration of uh, being able to uh, continue the life dream that I had when I was a kid growing up. And he didn't disappoint, leading the National League with 23 home runs his rookie year. Kiner swings and sends a powering belt deep to left field. It's going, going, it is gone. His sophomore season proved even better. 
kind of a Pittsburgh powerhouse tags another, and this one goes into the stands for a home run. Teaming up with newly acquired slugger Hank Greenberg, Kiner impressed at the plate, more than doubling his home run total to 51, tied for the best in the league while driving in 127 runs. I think the Greenberg influence had a lot to do with uh, his uh, success and with his swing. He had a great example to follow. The pitch and wow, it's another home run for Ralph Kiner who's rated by many as the greatest slugger since Babe Ruth. Despite Kiner's personal success, the Pirates finished tied for last. But there was a buzz in the Steel City, and Kiner was a big reason why. It was a very exciting year for baseball in Pittsburgh. They drew almost 1.3 million fans that year, which was a team that never even drawn 900,000 fans in a previous season. When they were not playing, and that, uh, not playing well and not winning, uh, he was the guy they came to see. So he was... He was larger than life on a team that, that didn't really have much success. For seven consecutive seasons, Kiner led the National League in home runs. Twice he hit more than 50 home runs, becoming the first player in National League history to achieve that feat. Great power, one of the all-time great power hitters. It was that stretch that turned him into a Hall of Famer. The fact that I was so consistent with uh, my home runs, and uh, even though I played with bad ball clubs, and then they had the luxury being on really good teams, I uh, was able to have something to shoot for throughout the year. In 1951, Pittsburgh management hired Branch Rickey, who brought with him a five-year plan to bring a pennant to the Steel City, one that included trading high-priced veterans like Kiner, who was shipped to Chicago in 1953. Kiner played two seasons with the Cubs, followed by one with the Indians before a back injury ended his career prematurely at the age of 32. If Kiner had been able to sustain even a normal decline, you could have seen him approaching 500 home runs. You could see him ranked, maybe he's one of the top five left fielders ever. It's gonna be quite a thrill for the fans in New York to see all the great stars in the National League for the first time in five years. Don't you think so? I think so, Ralph. With his playing career behind him, Kiner turned to his next calling in the play-by-play -play booth, serving one year with the White Sox before joining Lindsey Nelson and Bob Murphy with the Mets. They're about ready to play, and so are we. Right, Ralph Kiner? That's right, Lindsey. The trio's work together was well-documented, but individually, Kiner is best remembered for his post-game interviews in a segment called Kiner's Corner. Our guest on this special edition of Kiner's Corner here on the road is Frank Cashin. The thing about Kiner's Corner, it wasn't about Ralph, it was about you and the game. It was always very very positive. People are always, you know, happy and there was great smiles on your faces. So the insight that he gave us was based on his experiences and I think that's what's well needed. Yeah, Ralph Kiner. In his final year on the ballot, Ralph Kiner was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1975. The fact that I have a HOF after my name really makes it all so wonderful and also worthwhile. And it's, uh, it's just a great pleasure. Thank you. Legendary outfielder, slugger, broadcaster, and quite simply, one of the most beloved figures in the history of the New York Mets, Ralph Kiner. Grant Rickey had one of the great lines in baseball when he let Ralph Kiner go. He was the big star for the Pirates, and he came to Rickey asking for more money, and supposedly Rickey said, look, we finished last with you, we can finish last without you. And he sent him to the Chicago Cubs, who were just as bad. Here are Tom Seaver, Tim McCarver, and Vin Scully talking about Ralph Kiner. One of the things that I did as a child, uh, I was a voracious historical reader, and especially statistics, etc. I mean, Christy Mathewson and Walter Johnson and Carl Hubble and Babe Ruth and you know every 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 so-called name player, and Ralph was one of them, and his. The thing I remember, I was said, you know, the number, you know, his power numbers were, were phenomenal. I didn't know Ralph as a, as a baseball player, but from what I understand, from what I've read, uh, and from what uh, guys like Duke Snyder uh, told me, was that uh, when Ralph Kiner was still eligible to come up in the nine-inning game, regardless of where the Pittsburgh Pirates were at the time, People stayed in the stands to wait to see him hit. The thing that I remember most about Ralph Kiner was not how far he hit the ball, but how high he hit the ball and how far. And not just in old Greenberg Gardens and Forbes Field, uh, which I remember very well, 
But uh, one of the things in Forbes Field, uh, in those early days, they would clean out the blast furnaces in the uh, various places in Pittsburgh, and there would be a haze that would move into the ballpark around 9 o'clock. And we sat way up high, sometimes even on the roof of the ladies' room, believe it or not. And you would be looking down through a haze, and Ralph had come up and hit a home run. But it wasn't just a home run. It would come up through the haze and go back down through the haze and clear the fence in left field. So he was uh, he was a marvelous hitter, and it would tribute to him in Pittsburgh. When they were home, they would wait for Ralph Kiner to come to the plate. And most of the time, when Ralph kind of did whatever he did at that at bat, the whole ballpark, it seemed, would get up and go home and just say, okay, we won't see Ralph again, so we're good. Finally, the irrepressible Keith Olbermann on Ralph Kiner as an announcer. In 1961, he became an announcer with the White Sox, and the next year he joined the expansion team in New York, the Mets. When they were bad, Kiner and his partners Lindsey Nelson and Bob Murphy were the team's best performers. It took Ralph Kiner 15 years to get into the Hall of Fame because he was once dismissed as merely a home run hitter. In the same vein, his broadcasting work was often dismissed because he said some wacky things, like, if Casey Stengel were alive today, he'd be spinning in his grave. But his insight into game strategy, especially hitting, was flawless, and his humor underappreciated, as in what he said right after the singing of the Star Spangled Banner during an ordinary 1966 Mets radio broadcast from Cincinnati. Of the national anthem by the four quarters, and I guess you have to believe the stories that you read about inflation because five fellas were singing as the four quarters. I'm going to close tonight with Anna Gordy Gay, who died recently at the age of 92. She was the older sister of Barry Gordy, the Motown founder, and it's safe to say without her, there would have been no Motown. She helped Barry Gordy get money for Motown, she helped him with artists, she helped him with songs, and she pulled him out of the fire a couple of times when he got in a little bit of trouble. She was a no-nonsense, smart businesswoman, and she also happened to marry Marvin Gaye. She was in her late 30s, and he was in his early 20s when they got married. They were married for 12 years. It was a fairly tempestuous marriage. They both had their outside dalliances, shall we say. I think that Marvin Gaye, despite all his talent, was always prone to getting in some sort of trouble. Had it not been for the fact that he was married to the founder's sister, he probably would have been cut by Motown a long time before he was. I always like to play songs that were written about a specific person on this show. And when Marvin Gaye and Anna Gordy Gaye were getting divorced, she was getting a good settlement from him, which included royalties from his future albums. And this was a song that he wrote about her. It's called Anna Song, and it was in his jazz period of the late 70s. Anna, Anna, Anna. Yeah. This is in a song Hey baby Hey baby Loving you Yeah, he wasn't loving her all night long at that point anymore. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And in closing, I want to go back to a happier time between Marvin Gaye and Anna Gordy Gaye. And we'll go back to 1964. They had just gotten married. Marvin Gaye's career was on the way up. Motown was becoming one of the most successful record labels in America. The two of them were deeply in love. And Marvin Gaye wrote songs and sang about Anna Gordy Gaye. Here's a song he wrote about her, Pride and Joy. The Beatles asked to hear this one when they flew in from Kennedy for their gig on Ed Sullivan. Another one he sang about her was written by Holland Dozier and Holland around the same time, and he was really in love with her when he sang this. A being near you, so that I'm living for. You show me more kindness in little ways than I've ever known in all my days. Tell me, we'll spit. 